Okay, here we go. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. This is the 192nd edition of Changing Reality, the most important things. I am the hijacker. It's important. That's what I like to talk about. And so it is May the 2nd, the year of our Lord, 2013. And if it's Thursday night, it's usually Black Star Thursday night, Black Dwarf Star Thursday, where we talk about what's in our solar system, what, what planetary event is all the governments of the world expecting, what is the big backstory of what's coming through, and it ain't just some little comet. But if it's uh, Thursday, it's Black Star Thursday, and I've got Terrell 03 on and Sheldon Day on a panel. So, uh, Terrell, are you there? Yes, sir. Testing, testing. One, two, three. Okay. Um, well, Terrell, can you give us a little bit of an update on, uh, you know, what, what, where we're at, what we got? Okay. We're entering a critical phase of, of the timeline, and, well, I'm getting ready to go to the Ozarks, as a matter of fact. There's a, uh, there's a stream of data from a lot of researchers, uh, including, uh, the people that look into the future uh, that are saying that there's something that's going to happen before May the 20th. And Cliff High just came out with the the 20th of May date again in his recent um, presentation. And it just happens to be that my date is May 17th. And I'm not saying that something's going to happen on May the 17th. What I'm saying is is the, um, the object that I've been tracking for the last two years well, it's, it created a regular pattern, and through that pattern, I was able to draw an elliptical curve for something that was coming out of Leo, moving to the left in the orbit diagram. The ascension numbers were rising, and that would put it in Virgo and then moving into Libra. Well, the line, if you got my newsletter then or you watched my update video, I haven't posted that in the chat room yet, but I'm going to, then – you can see the line on the left side of Libra. That's where the Earth is going to be relative to the sun on May the 17th. And that's a very, very important date. Now, whenever I draw that curve around, then the, that's where the Earth crosses the orbit path of the star that's coming in. This is the leading hypothesis, by the way. There, right now I'm dealing with six because of fluctuating data. It's bothering me that the, the seismic data is not behaving like I think it should. I, uh, where I'm having low periods at the same time I'm supposed to be on the uptick. I'm supposed to see a steady uptick through this period. But at the same time, the uh, solar cycle 24 is not helping me. So the way I've been measuring this is through a secondary magnetic portal connection that's coming from the black star coming out of the somewhere between Virgo and Libra, and I've lost track of it because the pattern of seismicity has gone down when it's supposed to start going up, but that happened in the middle of February. Everything's going up again for a month. It looks like I'm right on, you know, I, I can put my finger on where the thing is, and then things drop off again. And the, uh, the important thing to realize is that if we are still inside of this guy's orbit uh, path, then we must come into alignment with it before May the 17th, if it's still outside Earth, uh, Earth orbit line. See, that's where the two orbit lines cross. So we're on our way. We're moving 1.6 million miles every day. Uh, we're leaving. Whenever we came into alignment with Saturn on the 28th of last month, then we were at the feet of Virgo constellation, moving into Libra now. And when we, get, by the time we get through Libra, we ha- we have to have an event. Um, otherwise, this thing has already crossed Earth orbit path, and it's on the inside of the, of the Earth. You see what I mean? Now that is for my four primary models. Then there's there's there are other models that are saying that we've, the thing is already behind us. So in other words, one of these events that we had, we learned that through hindsight. Um, that April the 2nd c- could turn out to be my event um, with Iceland, believe it or not. 484 quakes they had in a two-day period about the time we were supposed to go, to go through that trough. Now, the trough would have to be pretty wide and, and uh, it would have to be pretty wide and shallow in order for that to be my event. And if this object was a regular object like Jupiter or the Earth, then as it gets closer to the sun, then the, the trough between the two gravity wells should be deeper. And that means that we should have a more refined, I mean, a more definite event. For example, February 27th, 2010, 
Then that's when the Chile quake happened. We had 8.8 event, Pacific Ocean, ring of fire event, just like we're supposed to. And the Earth axis shift was three inches. So on the, the next near side alignment event on the 188 day cycle was Fukushima. And that was like right on, maybe just a little bit long, maybe uh, not even a full day behind schedule. But we had a four inch Earth axis shift with a 90 event. So you, you could see a pattern. Okay, now we, then we expected to have an event that looked like Guerrero that was on um, March the 20th, 2012, which I thought was our event you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, 24 uh, precursor quakes, four to six magnitude, just like Japan, just like Chile. So I, I knew that was going to be the event. They were actually having a war game exercise at the time. One hour later, here comes the event. But now it appears the whole thing was staged. The event actually took place on April the 11th, 2012. That was with Sumatra. And that was a 8.7 that cracked the tectonic plate in two. But you see what I mean. I'm seeing severe events that's happening on this near side alignment. And I have not had one of those yet in the orbit cycle. Now, whenever we add 19 days to the orbit cycle, that's what we did with, with the uh, Sumatra event. Then we have to add more days on this orbit cycle because apparently we have an inbound object that's reaching perihelion, and it's going much, much faster in velocity. That moves it farther left in the orbit diagram than I think. So I've been using the Earth, going, moving around in orbit, expecting to have the event any time, and then stop the orbit diagram, draw a line out in space, and that tells me where the object is. So that's been working for the last two to three years, and now I've lost my object. So I'm, I'm, a, little, uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned right now. And, um, you know, the fact that I see other predictions around May the 20th, and I remember last year that even Nighthawk was talking about a middle of May event from his sources for 2013. Well, that's – we're coming up on the crucial time in the, in the orbit period in this cycle um, right now. So there is, a, there is a place out there for this object. I know there is something coming. From space, I know there's something coming. I cannot tell you exactly what it is. It's a I call it a black star because in the Dakota report sent to me by Jim Mars for vetting, the these uh, lettered agency operatives mentioned Project Black Star and genocide. And Black Star, well, that characterizes the object. I was calling it a heavy mass object, a brown dwarf star in uh, previous orbit cycles. Now I realize that it's a black star. But there's other things that it could be. It could be a, a, a magnetar type of a neutron star. Um, and But likely, this is going to be something that's unclassified. I believe that it's going to be a binary twin to our sun, actually. And I think that this thing has come before. I think it came from Noah. I think it came from Moses. And now is about time for it, for it to come again. Okay, um, so May the 17th. Turns out to be a pretty big day on this timeline, enough to make me leave Florida and go to the Ozarks. This is my wargaming um, for this orbit cycle, and I think that everybody should be doing that. Um, I think everybody should be a survivalist and that you should have a date that you're preparing for, your crap hit the fan date, and at least once a year to refine your uh, your procedures. Um, so the, the convergence of data, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit distracted. Uh, then that's what we're coming up on right now. There is a place out there in orbit where this thing is coming in. Um, objects that come from far away, like Lovejoy, uh, the kind of a famous comet, came from the southern hemisphere, like S1. Objects that come from far away tend to come in close to the sun because they have less forward momentum in their orbit. Objects that are going faster, like in the asteroid belt, you'll notice that their orbit, whenever they come in, then they're going to have a wider they're, because they have the objects that are near the sun are moving faster. So if, for example, if Earth fell out of orbit, chances are it's not going to fall into the sun. It's going to make a wide turn around the sun and create an elliptical orbit. So that's another reason I believe this object is going to cross Earth's orbit path. And whenever you look at the historical precedent, then the Sumerians saw something with the Earth changes that they experienced uh, in Scripture, in uh, the, wor the Wormwood prophecies, looking at the asteroid belt. I think we have something that's close to the plane that I'm talking about the ecliptic plane, something that's interacting with the solar system right now. 
as something that is siphoning energy off of the sun. I think that, well, in Scripture, if you look at Scripture, then the, the sun turns dark according to Christ. It turns black according to Revelation. And the way that's going to happen scientifically, you know, without just having faith and reading it out of a book, out of I'm sorry, out of Scripture, then the way that would happen is magnetic portal connection. Uh, this other star comes in close. It's binary twin. It was actually much larger than our sun, and it collapsed on itself, but it, it still has a magnetic portal connection. Uh, to our sun, what that means is siphons off very little magnetism from our sun when it's far away on the other end of its orbit. But when it comes in very, very close, these magnetic portal connections, you might want to Google that. 2008 NASA magnetic portal connection. You'll see the Earth and the sun are connected by a magnetic portal connection. Okay, whenever this other, whenever this other star gets close to our sun, then it starts the, the internal conduits, the internal makeup of a magnetic portal connection includes active and passive conduits and whether they're active or passive depends on proximity it depends on how close it is so at the end these magnetic portal connections they attach themselves they detach and then they reconnect and whenever an object with an elliptical orbit like this uh, this object has that means that it's it's uh it comes in very near the sun and then spins around and goes very far away unlike the earth that just about goes in a complete you know, a circle well as it's coming to perihelion Perihelion position is whenever this object is moving maximum velocity and it's right next to the sun at its closest. Well, whenever that happens, then the magnetic portal connection is going to be extremely short. All of those internal conduits are going to become active. And then the sun is going to be injecting this other star with super doses of magnetism, which is draining the sun right now. Now, the evidence is that our, the heliosphere of our sun has shrunk by 25% in one decade. The magnetosphere of our planet has weakened over the last two decades. And, well, I think that's no mere coincidence because my view is that all things are connected. The sun and the earth are connected. If the earth is receiving less magnetism from the sun and that is the engine for its, its magnetosphere, then that magnetosphere is going to weaken also. So we should expect that our magnetosphere is going to continue to weaken as the heliosphere weakens because of this external effect, which is actually an internal effect because it's a binary twin to our sun. That is what makes the most sense looking at all the evidence, whether it's from Scripture, whether it's from 9-11. Believe it or not, 9-11 plays a role in this. It's connected through the House of Rothschild, that's the cause, and the Dakota report that talks about this black star and the genocide. That's coming with it. So Project Black Star 9-11 in scripture from if you go to my website, terralow3.com, then you'll see that's been the focus of my research for over a span of decades. And it's culminating right here in Project Black Star and in First Thessalonians chapter 5 in reference to the birth pangs and the pattern that I see out there, the earthquakes, the magnetic pole migration, mass animal deaths, the volcanism, the volcanoes that are spewing out, and the meteors, I know that Sheldon is going to want to talk about the rock storm. That's part of the newsletter that he's making a prediction about rock storm. And that looks highly likely, by the way. Then um, to me, when you put all this together, then it says, well, if I'm a son of, of the day, a child of the light, and I see these things, I see the patterns, then it's my responsibility to do something about it, not just to uh, – because I'm going to be raptured anyway kind of attitude. and Well, I don't need to do anything. I don't believe in that. And that's why I'm here sharing with you guys. And um, I'm just not – I'm not telling you to take borax. <laughs> I'm not telling you to go to the Ozarks. I'm not telling – you know, I, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm definitely telling you what I'm doing. And I've got a safe zone location in the Ozarks with a cavern with food and with water purification and with guns and ammo and a survival group and people that know how to live, to live off the grid, and they did so for – well, about 14 years before they ever had electricity. We're talking about having smoke houses and gardens and, and water cistern systems. And that's the way to survive what's coming, in my view. So whether you believe the train wreck is from a black star, collapsing society, the collapse of the dollar, World War III, uh, solar storms, uh, whatever you think it is, then the answer is going to be the same thing. It's going to be to get yourself away from the coast, definitely. And away from the large population areas, which happen to be near the coast a lot of the time, and away from the calderas out west of the United States, 
and away from the nuclear power plants in the east, which puts you in the central part of the United States, west of the Mississippi River Basin, east of the Rocky Mountain Ridge, and then far enough south to avoid the pyroclastic flows from the bulging calderas that are going to break. So when you look at the Navy maps of the future, Casey maps, the Scallion maps of the future, which I have, then they show a pattern too. The shorelines are all eroded. The, the large calderas are broken. Northern Europe is gone. And Western United States is gone you know, for those reasons. So I I've, I've, have a safe zone map for my newsletter subscribers, and I give them safe zone location information. And um, I do threat assessment for them, contingency planning. And, and sometimes there hasn't been a lot of demand for it, but sometimes help them connect with safe uh, with groups that are already formed. And that's pretty much I, I can finish up the uh, remainder of my report. I know Sheldon has some things to share, and I would like to hear um, I'd like to give uh, Sheldon the opportunity to share at this at this first half hour and then I can continue later. Yeah, Sheldon, why don't you try, chime in because we we got five minutes before the first break, and then uh, we'll come back with you. But why don't you go ahead and uh, what are you talking about rocks? Um, I didn't catch that part. Well, Terrell was talking about the flooding. Um, I just recently uncovered in my research that um, there's actually uh, pyramids in an underground um, facility out there in the Grand Canyon, and the reason they call it one of the wonders of the world out there is because um, they keep us wondering what what that really is out there, and that's uh, actually uh, the Hopis went underground out there at one point to escape the flooding that we had in our past. So that that entire Grand Canyon area, Grand Canyon area was uh, carved out by uh, an ocean that used to be there, so this water could come pretty far inland. Um, I also wanted to say, um, for people out there always worried about a date when this thing is coming, I like to take the mentality John Moore portrays on that. Uh, if you're prepared, you, you never have to worry about a date, so just be prepared. And my intelligence gathering efforts are coming to the conclusion that we're going to witness some type of uh, bombardments, bombardment of rocks from space here probably within the next few weeks. Uh, if you go to the Weather Channel, and they have some interesting stories they're covering, like uh, they just had one a, a stone that hit the solar array panel on the space station. What are they trying to tell us there? Then there was a, it was either, I think it was a meteor that came down over Argentina a few days ago. And then last night in the Northeast, there were uh, two fireball events. I'm still uh, researching that one. Are you saying we're coming through dirty space? Is that, is that what you're saying? We're coming through, you know, a whole bunch of asteroids and fireballs and stuff like that? Well, um, there's another res another research associate on our team. Her name is Ann Morrison. She's on John Moore's show and she put out an exponential graph of the in, the tremendous increase of uh, space rocks over the last few years, and it's really gone up on an exponential curve. And I think that the, um, we're seeing more rocks because, um, in in part and parcel, the, these comets coming in are bringing rocks with them. Uh, what do you think, Terrell? Well, the uh, I, I see we're coming up on a break. I, I could talk on that for a while. The, the nudging effect is what we're seeing. The, the The black star that's coming in here has rotating, spiraling electromagnetic arms. And it's spiraling like a hurricane. And as it's coming through the asteroid belt, it's nudging objects out of orbit. Or it's already been, it's already been doing that. So ever since that it was on the outside of the belt, and remember it's near the plane, so it has a nudging influence on objects that would fall out of orbit soon anyway, and maybe over the next 10 years. But whenever it nudges them, it pushes them out of orbit sooner. So this is a symptom that there's something coming. So some of those objects, well, whenever I wish Michael Owens was here. Um, he's a fantastic astronomer, and he has the equipment to be able to show you those rocks that are coming out of orbit. And he, showed, he took over my desktop and showed me massive amounts of stuff coming out of the LEO constellation at the time the object was over in LEO. Okay, everybody, hang on. We'll be right back. Uh, just a short break, like a couple minutes, and then we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back, folks. You're listening to Revolution Radio at Freedom Slips. Uh, this is the 192nd edition of Changing Reality, where I traffic in the most important things. And we are listener-supported, so anything that you can do to, to help support the station, just go to freedomslips.com. There is a donate button. 
or get a coffee mug, a T-shirt, go to the survival store. This is a listener-supported station. In other words, non-commercial. Uh, we are the largest non-commercial radio station on the planet. So that's, that's a fact. Um, and so we need you all to support us, to help us out. Now, on Thursdays, we do Dark Star. Everybody wants to say, because we didn't hit the date of April 2nd or whatever it was of the 188-day cycle, that all of a sudden they go, well, it's all over with now. Let's throw it out. And I'm a little weak on the whole thing. But this is my problem. I have no other theory or concept of why all of these things are happening. I mean, somebody needs to break a master key. I heard Professor James uh, McKinney um, saying people talking about Planet X, and they just don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, it's always like they're a loon. They need to go to their room and take a chill pill. You know, he's alluding to it. Um, there's absolutely no evidence for it, although he doesn't get any data because it's all been classified. And so, and he always talks about, well, they need, they need the data. That's the way you do it scientifically. Well, explain to me exponential growth in volcanoes, uh, earthquakes. Why is the weather messed up? Why is the ice melting in the Arctic? Why, why is the, um, the true north um, magnetic uh, pole moved all the way down to Siberia? Why is it raining all of a sudden on uh, Saturn's moon Tyson? Why, what happened to the red dot on Jupiter? You know, what, what's going on with all these other planets? Why, why are people just stealing money left and right? Why are they moving all their militaries off the, off the friggin' coast? Why are they starting all these crazy wars? Why do they do 9-11? Why, what, why are all the birds and fish dying? I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on, and nobody comes up with a theory to, to pull it all together, except Terrell. And now, because he's missed the date, all of a sudden, you can't, uh, now we throw the whole baby out with a bathwater. So, can somebody call in and replace the theory, please? You know, Mar explain the Mars quakes. Just explain anything, the craziness with the sun, or, or, or lack of what the sun's doing, except what it did a day ago. It released such a massive uh, kill shot that if that sucker, if we had been a point-blank range with that a CME that re re was released on May 1, uh, lights out, bye-bye. Oh, by the way, NASA did tell us in 20, by 2012 uh, to 2013, we can expect a Carrington. And why are they saying that? Why do they allude to there's a Planet X? Amy Winehouse, or whatever her name was, when she was asked that and she got tripped up. Why are they shutting all the, oh, why are they classifying all the information? I mean, it goes on and on. Why is the C one and a half, 1.2 degrees of uh, temperature raised? And its acidity is, is picking up like crazy. I mean, it can go on and on and on and on. Somebody needs to call in and, and you got a better theory, throw it out there. But anyways, Terrell, I mean, the one thing is, is that people say, well, <clears throat> there should be a picture by now. There, there, there should be some way we can see this thing, even if it is, um, you know, a black dwarf star um, that when it moves in front of other stars, it would block it out. I mean, we should see that sucker. That's that's been the thinking there, Terrell. So, what about the picture deal? Well, I wish it was that easy, but like I said, Scripture says that they will say peace and safety, and destruction will come upon them. It's gonna, be, it's and it's coming like a thief in the night, and that fits this guy to a T. The and then remember that about seventy astronomers engaged in dark star imaging research have been murdered or they're missing since 1997. That's in uh, Stu Noodle's uh, Dead Astronomy Report in the Dropbox folder for newsletter subscribers. Then um, well, some of the other symptoms, um, Saturn Superstorm developed coming through the Leo constellation and the uh, magnetosphere flipping around March the 12th and 13th, 2012. That's one year and one day after Fukushima. That's on the 188-day cycle. So there's a lot of evidence. What can turn the magnetosphere around like that? Hot flow anomalies, short duration. Gamma ray bursts, short duration. There's nothing that can turn the magnetosphere around for 28 hours. That's, that's written and down in a book. There's no historical precedent for it. 
Oh, That's Terrell, I got like 55, I'm up to like 55 witnesses now. I mean, you know, all the stealing of the money where they don't even care, all the underground bases. Now they're buying bullets. Just, you know, one thing of ghost cities in China or even building them in uh, South Africa up on the high uh, plains up there. So, no, it, could, it just goes on and on and on. I mean, and nobody comes up with a, an explanation for you know, you know what the environment's doing, or human behavior. I mean, the whole, uh, there's so many things. I ought to dig out that show and just do two hours on nothing but all of the witnesses and let somebody come up with something else. Well, like, like Sheldon's source said right there, space rocks, they're hitting us with more frequency. Last year there were 249 meteors that had sound connected to them, not just meteors ones with sound connected to them. In 2008, that number was zero. In 2009, that was one. But now the number's going parabolic. And there's so many of the, the graphs I look at going parabolic. The six to eight magnitude earthquakes, they show a regular pattern following the solar maximums for the last century until 2005 to 2008. Now they're going parabolic. What's doing it? The sun is in a lull when it's supposed to be going to maximum. The, the, there's a disconnect between the solar maximums and the six, six to eight magnitude quakes. So what is it? It's the same thing that's turning the magnetosphere around. And it's happening now, and they're not allowing us to see the data. We used to have many different data streams for magnetosphere simulations. Now I think we're looking at a singular, and I think that it's not even live anymore. What I think they're doing is they're using a, they're using a supercomputer to look at the sun and say this is what's supposed to happen. And they're erasing the data that's coming from the opposite side of space from where we are now, out in the Libra constellation. Sheldon, do you have something you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, well, people might have forgot about this story. This was put out by Space.com um, back in June 10th, 2009. Even though SpaceWeather.com always shows us, you know, the near-Earth objects that are out there. But this story was came out back in 2009, military hush-up, incoming space rocks now classified. And um, on a side note, that uh, space shuttle flight that uh, Gabrielle Gifford's husband went up on, uh, Mark Kelly, STS-134, uh, that shuttle flight back in 2010 uh, lofted a mic micrometeorite uh, debris shield up to the International Space Station. So... <clears throat> They're probably well aware that the 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 density of these this income these incoming rocks are going to get heavier as time progresses. And I, I also wanted to add there, hijacker, you were talking about. Uh, well, I can't remember what it was, but um, the Obama a year or two ago had shut off these earthquake sensing satellites. Do you remember that, Terrell? Um, <laughs> yes, in that 2009, that that changed the the legislation. NASA cannot inform us of inbounds anymore. And now the Department of Homeland Security is, is monitoring and, and shutting off the magnetosphere simulations. They're freezing the data and they're omitting it. And they're, they're doctoring the data. And they, they say they're doing it because of NASA directive. And that NASA directive is going to be that 2009 law that was passed giving, uh, that we're taking away NASA's ability to inform us and turning that over to the Department of Defense. So the Department of Defense is now working with the Department of Homeland Security, and they are that they are controlling our ability to monitor the data. And I assume that's not just for the sun and the magnetosphere. I assume that they're in, in inbound objects that are coming in. I think that they're doing it pretty much everything. But whenever they're 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 uh, classifying the data of the magnetosphere. When they're classifying magnetosphere data, turning them off for five days at the time they've been doing it, then that means that it is connected to an inbound object, according to the NASA directive, you see. So the fact that they're doctoring the data tells us that the turning around of the magnetosphere is connected to the inbound object that they're not supposed to be telling us about. I got this up here right now. This was actually put out by Lyndon LaRouche, the um uh, March of 2011, decision to cancel NASA seismic tracking radar satellite was made from the top down. That's where uh, they had turned off those satellites so they could detect earthquakes on the Pacific coast. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's so many things now. Um, but Tyrrell's right. 
if they are shutting off that information, that data about the magnetic sphere, it's got to be something inbound because what, what could turn that around? And for people who don't understand it, it basically we kind of follow the sun in like a coma. We go around the sun, but it's more, we're being like a corkscrew. We're being pulled along. But the solar wind always comes at us from one direction, from the sun. And the magnetosphere is sort of like a flag or a woman's hair in the wind. It always blows one way, and that's away from the sun. And I think it was last year, Terrell would know the date, for 23 or 28 hours, the hair actually faced towards the sun in a possibility. Now, does Professor McKenna have a reason for that? Can he explain that one? I mean, he just poo poos and says, oh, the, the, the solar storms, I mean, the super storms on uh, Saturn that's connected to this thing. And he goes, well, there's no data there. Well, explain why there, there are these super storms on Saturn. Well, hijacker, I would, I would like to encourage your audience to uh, take McCanny to task and everybody bombard him with an email asking him this question. Um, back in 2004, he was reporting that a mini solar system uh, was being tracked by the Wormwood Observatory in Australia. And then, you know, he doesn't talk about that anymore. We had to ask McCanny, what did the mini solar system that was coming in just turn around or what? Oh, yeah, I remember somebody put in chat that McCain just came out with that, and they cut it up and doctored it like it just happened. And, of course, I'm so crazy over stuff, you know. Um, I'm like a fish in the water. It looks like If it looks like a worm, I'm jumping at it. And um, But I caught myself on that one. I listened real closely. Yeah, I know, who, I know who did that, Hijacker, but if you go back and listen to the original recording McCann, he did in 2000. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he did say that. Yeah. But i just like to get his big brain engaged in saying, okay, then here's all these data points. Or they're all lined up, so give us your best shot of what you think is going to happen. Um, outside of sticking to comets, uh, and the electric universe type thing and that comments aren't dirty snowballs. He's not explaining why they're shutting the data off, why they're doing all this, why the government's acting like that, why, you know, Mars is having quakes, why, why are all the different planets much brighter right now? They're all increased in brightness. I mean, come on, jump in the fight. Give it, give us, give us a theory, anything. And so, yeah, we missed that date, which is, it's probably more scarier. It's probably it's sh it shot past us because it's it's either it's got to be right on top of us uh, and moving fast. So I don't know, Terrell. You want to chime in here? Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, looking at uh, as a matter of fact one of McCanny's works, Planet X, Comets, and Earth Changes by J. M. McCanny, is featured in my newsletter, and I see the dirty snowball comment that you're referring to, but the reality is going to be that there's going to be a spectrum of objects that have different properties in the Kuiper Belt that is beyond Neptune, that's between Neptune's orbit, 30 astronomical units, and uh, Pluto's outside orbit, which is 50 astronomical units, and then the scattered disk is beyond that, and then the Oort cloud surrounds us. Well, those objects out there, that's where the comets come from, the cold stuff, made out of thanes, ethane, methane and the like, and they're going to have a nucleus. And some of them are dirty snowballs, I just hate to tell you. Some of them are. But then some of them are just hard as rocks, and there's everything in between. It's going to be a spectrum. Okay, They're not all going to behave the same way. Whenever they fall out of orbit, almost half of them reaching perihelion are going to be destroyed, whether they crash into Jupiter's gravity well or Saturn's or the sun. That's, that's just a fact. That's what happens. They get stretched apart. And the larger they are, the the more forward the leading edge is from the trailing edge, and it's pulled that much harder, and it's it's pulled apart, and then the next part's pulled apart, it gets stretched into a straight line. That happens to, to comets. They don't know that S1, um, that, I have a lot of questions about S1. I'm, I've answered a bunch of those in the newsletter this week for Bonnie, as a matter of fact. Um, nobody knows if it's, if it's a snowball or if it's hard as a rock. Nobody knows. So what's it going to do? 
if it's a snowball, it's going to be stretched apart, reaching perihelion. It's beginning about two weeks to ten days to seven days, depending on its, its compaction, how well compacted it is. Then it, whenever it comes around the sun, that's when it's going to develop the tail. If it's, if it's sturdy and held together well, then it's going to come around the, uh, the sun. But here's the thing. I, I cannot find any thread associated with S1, not any at all. This this object is 62 degrees above the plane. It is definitely not connected to anything to do with my object. It's above the. It's from Earth position now. Looking at it, it's it's coming from above the Gemini constellation, and it's going to cross in front of us a long ways, and uh, reaching perihelion. But it's still above the plane, far above the plane. 61. You know, draw the plane a straight line out there, then draw a 62 degree angle. That's how high it's coming from above the plane, and then. It's going to be going a little over 90,000 miles per hour. Right now it's going about 50,000 miles per hour. It's, in, under, it's traveling above the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. It's going to pass far in front of the Earth. It's going to reach perihelion on the back side of the sun from the Earth. If there's if the, uh, the most likelihood of a, uh, of a solar flare that's connected to this object is going to go the opposite direction for sure. Then if, after it reaches perihelion, then we're going to see the tail develop. It's going to come around the corner. It's going to and come be coming kind of in our direction briefly, and then it's going to cross in front of the Earth about 40 million miles above the plane. And I anticipate that if it holds together, if it's a tight ball, then we're going to get a dusting of microparticles, and that's it. It's going to pass out of the solar system. Nothing else connected to this object, as far as uh, hey, the. Uh, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. But, um, you know, it's coming in at 62 degrees above the ecliptic. But if it does have companion objects by it, couldn't those companions cause the sun to flare out before it reaches perihelion? Well, you would expect that two weeks to ten days, it, you know, depending on. Because it's the sun's defense mechanism that's coming into play there. But they're still on the opposite side. By the time this thing turns around and comes back, it's still in 40 million miles in front of us. This is happening while we're in the, in the perfect place in the solar system, uh, on the opposite side of the sun from it. Now, if we were around on the other side of the sun, then it, would, it could be a concern. But remember that you're talking about a comet. Now, come on. We're talking about a comet here. It's basically ice. You can say that it's, well, it's not a snowball, but it's still made out of ice. The gravity well that's connected to this thing is very shallow. It, can, it cannot possibly hold substantial objects in orbit. It's impossible for it to do that. In my view, the, something like Jupiter has got a deep well. It's, it's very massive. But, and, and, you know, the Earth is sitting, you know, because of the, the makeup of our planet, then it's sitting in a deep enough well that we have, you know, a singular moon. But this object's made out of ice. A, a chunk of ice out there, you know, it's going to have a nucleus, but, but there's a chunk of ice out there. I just don't see it. Um, I th- hey, Terrell, I got, a, I got a question for you real quick. They're saying it's going to be ten times brighter than the moon. So don't you think they're giving us disinformation? Well, the object you're talking about cannot be a star-like object like a binary twin. It cannot be a peripheral dwarf either. Something that's created as a secondary disk out on the periphery of our solar system, it's impossible because those objects, whether it's a binary star that I'm tracking, whether it's a peripheral dwarf that I'm tracking, they are going to be on the plane. Okay, that whenever our solar system was created, they were created too. And they have a planetary relationship with our sun. So the object I'm tracking has a planetary relationship. I know that by the pattern of seismicity going back to 1965. But this object that's S1 cannot create a pattern of seismicity. It's impossible. It would have to be on the plane. And even if that object was on the plane, it is not nearly massive enough. Not merely, not even close to anything. Well, I know one massive. thing, Major Ed Dames, uh, he sure has taken it quite seriously. He's uh, holding two closed-door meetings later this year, and he thinks that this ice on is the Blue Star Kachina. Well, th- the reason you get a Blue Star Kachina in this scenario is because of the nudging effect of the Black Star. You're going to get one. It's not the same one that's coming every time. It's because the star is coming in the law of probability. There's enough objects out there, and the nudging effect creates the conditions to push that star. But that object that's coming there, I can't see how it was nudged out by my object. It's going to be on the plane. It's going to be coming. This thing is still far to the right. What is it, about two hours, two to three hours to the right 
of my object. Now, maybe see, so it's far. Whenever you draw that 60 degree angle, 62 degrees out to the Oort cloud above the scattered disk, you're far above the plane. You're too far above the plane to be affected by any object that's on the plane that's moving stuff out of the Kuiper belt. So if this object was a Kuiper belt object, if it was on the plane coming in here, didn't have a 62 degree inclination, then I would be with him. But here's the deal. This is what I think you're looking at. There's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of disinformation. There's CIA operatives. They are spreading disinformation everywhere and they're seeing where it goes. And well, some of the people are listening to that and I think that they're being affected by it. But I'm, you know, I think I'm a pretty good researcher and, and I've, I've only been doing this for three years, but I understand the characteristics of the comet and where it's coming from in space and where it's going to reach perihelion and where the Earth's position is. The proximity is everything. And I don't see a problem. If I ever do see a problem, then I'll come on to Revolution Radio and tell you guys. But right now, I don't see a problem with it. Now, it's possible that on the timeline that this thing is coming in, that there is something else that's going to happen, and that's the cloak and dagger disguise routine that's being played on right here. So they can't, they can't tell you about the real scenario. They can't tell you that. They, they would be endangering the underground Arc City programs if they told you the truth. You see what I mean? So the, the, the guy that's watching all of us, even the lettered agencies, is artificial intelligence. He's running simulations into the future. And when he sees somebody that trips the wire, that creates a threat for the Rothschild Underground Arc City program, those people are taken out in our time because they're running those timelines out into the future using futuristic simula simulations, using all of your contact information. They're creating real worlds with you in it and me in it. There's a radio show going on right now with Sheldon and Hijacker, and you guys are listening. And they they run that out into the future. They know what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And whenever that CIA operative, it doesn't matter who it is, me, you, it doesn't matter. When we trip the wire that creates the threat, then he kills us in the past, which is today for us. That's the way it works. So. There was so much counterintelligence out there, I'm not surprised that there's stories going on, and it's likely that there's some truth to it, but you're going to have to read between the lines in order to figure it out. Open mic. How about the UFO sightings that are going through the roof right now? Well, some of that's going to be raising of awareness. People's awareness is being raised, um, although before – Last two days, I was really wondering if I should even do any more radio shows because there's really not a lot of support for the research. Um, it seems like as this thing gets closer, more and more people are going to sleep. Whenever I yeah. show up at Pow Talk, for the two, two orbit cycles ago, I would show up at Pow Talk and, and have to field 100 questions. There would be 200 people there. Today, there's not 30 people in all the rooms put together. And they want to talk about dating and crazy stuff. You know, yeah, life's I, going, I, life's going, see, life's going on, Terrell. They're not thinking anymore because 2012 passed, and they don't realize all these dates are just just to throw them off because something is coming. You just got to you'll deal with when it comes. But so much, man. Well, it's a de uh, desensitizing program, and I'm part of it. I hate to admit it, but I'm part of it. And yeah, I believe that. That's one of the reasons that I'm still walking around is making dates and things like that and being wrong. I know there's something coming out. Of the, uh, it was in the Leo constellation. Now it's Virgo, it's, and now I'm having to chase it. But I know that there's something coming, but it's like chasing a ghost. And I wish I could give you better data, but Scripture says it comes like a thief in the night. And it is. And I'm doing the best that I can every day, but I have been I have le helped in the desensitization process at Revolution Radio. And I apologize, but... I'm doing an investigation, just like scripture investigation took decades, 9-11 investigation. I'm doing it one day at a time using the best available evidence and, you know, the data that's coming in. But then you have to remember that our eyes are being covered up and our ears are being closed off and there's disinformation everywhere. What are you going to do? You know, I'm doing, I'm doing the best I can you know, with the information that I have. And, and I am still saying that there is something, you know, that, that is happening, but – I'm, I'm just showing you the pattern. You know, pattern recognition is, is, is you know, I'm, I'm very you're good at that. You're, you're, you're putting hope out there. You're doing a good job, Charlie. You're but what I'm hope saying is, is that I have tens of thousands of of uh, 
of YouTubers as subscribers, and not even half of them even look at the video. And I'm a YouTuber. I watch your YouTube videos all the time for yeah, years. Uh, years just, well, just look at the numbers. You know, the, 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 there'll be only two thousand people that even watch an update video sometimes. Yeah, and then, you can't trust you can't trust those Terrell too because they can doc, document them too, where you're not getting no. Well, there's a lot of ways to no test to see if you're effective, and it would be the okay. number of questions that you're fielding. And things like that. How many how many people call in on this radio show and ask a question? Terrell. Yeah, well, hang on, everybody. We'll, 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 uh, we're at the top of the hour. We'll be back in about five, six minutes. Uh, so we'll be right back for another hour. Okay, welcome back, everybody. It's Black Star uh, Thursday. Uh, this is the 192nd edition of Changing Reality, the most important things. I'm the hijacker. Um, we are listeners support of this radio station, so anything that you can do to help us, uh, you know, throw the station 10, 20 bucks, uh, anything you can do. I used to have a hijackers club, but I think uh, some people on the station that didn't like it, uh, Nighthawk didn't care, but I, so I guess it was a political decision. Um, so do what you can do. You know, if, if it comes during my show, just say this is support. Uh, hijacker and uh, Nighthawk, he'll get the message. You know, he'll know where it comes from. But uh, also, Terrell, um, I wanted to ask you a question, but f before I do that, um, can you give out your contact information and where people can get uh, your newsletter, your YouTube, that type of thing? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's only one way to support the research, and that is to go to terrell03.com, T E R R A L 03. 03.com, and there are no banners, there's nothing except for um, you become a newsletter subscriber, and then I send you Dropbox folder links to 2012, 52 issues of the newsletter, and that includes the Dead Astronomer Report, pardon me, Dead Astronomer Report by Stu Noodle, and that includes the work of Michael Owens before he passed away last year on April the 2nd, and all the issues for this year, my books, The Mystery Explained, and The 9-11 Truth, Exposing the Cheney Rumsfeld Black Operation. Those are in PDF form and lots and lots of other stuff, about a 100 documents that are in there. Um, None Dare Call a Conspiracy by former Congressman Gary Allen. I read it in the 70s. I think everybody should read that book. So the things that I feel that you need as a researcher, that's what the Dropbox folder links uh, give you, is information. And then you can run your own investigation and draw your own conclusions. So that's the only way to support me in my research is by going to terrell03.com. Okay. And also on the panel is uh, Sheldon Day. Uh, Sheldon, do you want to chime in anything right now? Yeah. Folks would like to go to my website. Um, it's thelightofdayradioshow.com. And I have, I actually have Stu Noodle's uh, Dead Astronomer Report posted on the very top there. And um, if you go to, if you click on the Planet X logo on the top of my homepage, it'll take you to the Planet X subpage where I have uh, a lot of uh, radio show interviews posted, like ones that John DiNardo has done, John Moore, uh, Gilbert Erickson, Lucas. It's, it's probably among the, the best Planet X uh, research website out there. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks so much. One more time, because people might not have got it. What, what sure. Yeah, it's the light of day radio show dot com. The light of day radio show dot com. <clears throat> okay, thanks so much. Now, Terrell, we got all these different things that are happening, both uh, in governments, finances, military, environment, uh, things that are happening with the polls, um, and so you got this overriding theory on. Um, um, you know, that the black star is causing that. So I'm going to hit you with something. Um, give me how do all these sinkholes, there are sinkholes opening up everywhere. It's undeniable. Trucks are falling everywhere. People, are, little girls are falling in China right through the street. People are falling all over the place. Holes opening up everywhere. Louisiana, Minnesota, there are so many different state sinkholes. So I think there's like three million alone that are opening up just in um, right around Israel in the Middle East, uh, something phenomenal. So how would how would your theory explain 
the exponential growth of the sinkhole phenomenon? Okay, good question. Uh, well, it's dynamic. There's not one answer. Um, in the northern hemisphere, particularly, you're going to see that that uh, trend continue. It's going to continue going up. The um, ocean conveyor disruption began with the diminishing ice sheets in the north. So first you had accelerated uh, ocean current, and then there's less water up there to melt, and that slows down the, um, the, the ocean conveyor. And so now you're seeing co the colder winters taking, uh, taking effect. You First you get mild, and then you get extremely strong. But see, that's connected also to the magnetic pole migration that's happening. That's the reason that airports are changing the names of the runways, because the magnetic North Pole is moving faster and faster, and those planes and the GPS, they fly by the magnetics of the planet, just like the birds. And Carol, isn't that migrating like 40 miles a year? Well, it's kind of going in a spiral. So it's not, in, it's not exactly in a straight line, but it's moving. I think that, that that's the right number that you just hit right there. But it's accelerating, and that would be because of proximity. As that third magnet, see the sun is in magnetic polarity control. It's the giant magnet in the center of the – I didn't realize I still had Pal Talk on. I apologize. It's, in, it's a magnetic – I'm going to close that. Magnetic polarity control of everything in our solar system that's magnetic. And our planet is magnetic. And so um, – Apologize for the distraction there. Um, it, kind of it, it kind of threw me off a little bit. Oh, you asked about the magnetic North Pole. See, that plays a role too because the jet stream uh, fluctuations are caused by the, mi the migrating pole in conjunction with the ocean conveyor that is now disrupted. So now we're at the point in the cycle where it's eventually <laughs> the, nor the northern ice sheets are going to rebuild themselves because the warm water that's at the equator – it's no longer going to be able to reach all the way north. So that's what you're seeing now. That's why you're seeing the colder winters first on the other side of the planet over in Asia and Europe because the magnetic north pole is going that direction. So just imagine that the circulating jet stream is following it. That means it's dipping farther south on the other side of the planet. But then we're at a point in the cycle now where the cold air, since it's not getting the help from the warm waters of the equator, then, then now the cold air is amassing, and the area above the jet stream is becoming larger. So now, so the jet stream, even on our side of the planet, we had mild winters, and the, I was predicting a mild winter this time too. But the cycle is further along than I thought. So now the jet stream widens out, and the cold, the, the everything becomes colder, and you have packs of ice that grow higher. So the reason you're seeing that on the other side of the planet first, and now it's going to come to the United States too, even worse, is because of those giant ice packs that are melting. That is causing a change in the the uh, the water table, that very quick, and all that melt, that water all has to go somewhere, and so you see an increased flooding around the planet, and then changes in the water table mean that you're going to get the sinkholes. So it's but all of this is induced by the inbound black star. It's all it's all caused by it, but some of it is not directly because of it. But Take then careful. you have the uh, there's one there's one more part. The increase in the large magnitude earthquakes that causes the shaking, the cavitation, the shaking, and then the wa the higher water tables. Whenever you add those together, then and with more frequency, then whenever you the, the combination means that you must have more sinkholes, and that's exactly what we're seeing. This is a symptom that the black star is getting closer. Well, is the Earth expanding? And then we got a caller. Is the Earth expanding, Terrell, because of uh, it's getting hotter and you know, things that get hot? I think yeah. that, isn't that the way it works if it gets hot? Well, can I interject quick? Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, um, John DiNardo, our, another Planet X researcher on our team here, he made an incredible discovery when that BP Gulf oil spill happened. He he uncovered in, in the research that the, what the elites were actually doing were tapping into an undersea oil uh, volcano out there, and, uh, well, they got more than what they, they bargained for, and that's what actually stopped that, uh, that the Gulf Stream uh, out there. Okay, but he, he, if he looks a little further, then he's going to see that, remember Halliburton was doing the mudding operation, and Halliburton was used to break the salt dome. That's out there that the the deep water horizon, that whole event 
was staged. Uh, the, the the well, the whole, the accident, everything. The the oil that spilled in there did not have to spill in there. The uh, Super Suck International, the, the fellow that owns the company, I, I talked with him a lot of times. He tried to get his rigs in there, and they wouldn't let him because they needed the cover to break the salt dome. Well, of so, course, it was all staged. They wanted to cover this up. They they don't want the people of the world to know that these natural disasters are getting worse. So they had to stage it and say, well, you know, we'll just blame it on corporate stupidity or whatever. But to stop the flow by an internal mechanism, I don't believe is possible. In other words, you can have an upwelling inside the Gulf of Mexico, but how's that going to stop the flow coming from the ocean conveyor? That that's going to be caused by the amount of drip that's coming from the northern ice sheets in the northern hemisphere. Well, I haven't studied that in a while, but I think they were trying to use the corrects to try to slow down that uh, that leak. I'm not sure. Oh, they could have stopped the leak on the first day. If they would have wanted to, they could have contained the oil in one location and Super Suck International would have reclaimed the oil and, and resold it to them for a fee. They would have still made money on the oil that would ended up dissipating, but they would not allow. Remember that they uh, they, they uh, created legislation that would would not allow other uh, the companies from other nations to come in and assist. And whenever the, South Africa is way ahead of everybody on that and. This guy became my personal friend. He used me because of my pressure sheet technology uh, inventions, actually. He was uh, using me to uh, – to he consulted with me on different operations, and he's the one that advised me of what was going on there. And what they did is they broke the salt dome. So that salt dome now south of Louisiana is sitting there filled with salt water. It, it's a, like a bird's nest turned upside down. And whenever this, this thing gets close enough, the earth's going to shake enough, the new Madrid is going to go off, and then the caterpillar crawl is going to race south. And when it does, it's going, to, it's going to break that salt dome. That's going to start the cascade that is going to wind up seeing the entire Mississippi River basin flowing out into the Gulf of Mexico in the salt water. Uh, displacement is going to go all the way to Lake Michigan. Well, regardless of whatever did happen during the BP oil spill, it is interesting that John Moore – predicted that the Gulf Stream would stop two or three years before it did. He he was right on with that one. Hi, Jack. It looks like you have lots of yeah, callers. Yeah, yeah. Actually, ask Terrell, you got, you got a special guest here. Um, you got the station and the owner of Revolution Radio, uh, Nighthawk. <coughs> um, so what say you, Nighthawk? Uh, oh, I just I have to take care of something real quick. I don't mean to interrupt your show, but... Uh, We've started the subscription-based archives, download archives. It's like five bucks a month or 40, 35 bucks a year. Um, either user listeners have either got an old page cashed up or they actually need to use their subscription money to uh, check into a literacy program. Uh, it very clearly says on the page I enter each user manually into the system. As soon as I see the confirmation, I do occasionally go to work. I also sleep at times, so please allow eight to 12 hours for activation. Sometimes it just takes me a minute, but if it's in the middle of the night, Eastern time, I might not get it all set up until 7 or 8 in the morning. So have a little patience, folks. Um, I am uh, getting quite a few people getting signed up for the archives, which is awesome. Thank you very much. I do not appreciate people seeing emails saying I ripped them off because I didn't get them entered into the system like 14 minutes later. So Yeah, well, people got to understand, Nighthawk, you put this whole station together on a shoestring. And really, according to normal stations, the way they run, you're still running the thing on a shoestring. So, you know, there's going to be. You know, yeah, and I have to. I have to enter the users manually because I can't afford the $250 PayPal paygate. So, and, and somebody to actually go figure out how the freaking thing works. So, well, listen, uh, the archives. Um, I thought you do all that on YouTube, Nighthawk. Well, they can download the podcast as well. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, revolutionradioarchives.com. I see. Oh, I see. Okay, and that's that's what people are signing up for, um, which is fine. I just, you know, it's like almost everybody's been really patient, but I've had a couple of people that, you know, it's like I'll get their thing at like seven. I get, You know, I had one person, they signed up at seven minutes after midnight, or that's when I got the email that they signed up. And then by 14 minutes after midnight, they had opened a, like a, a PayPal payment dispute. You know, I hadn't had a chance to open up the system and enter them in. You know, it's like, come on, man. So 
please, please uh, clear your cache because apparently either people are not seeing this gigantic uh, 24 font um, notice on the page that says uh, give 8 to 12 hours for activation. So, All right. Okay. It sounds good, Nighthawk. All right. Sorry for bugging you. I just, I'm just i getting tired of getting these cranky emails because people have no patience. Well, I know you get hot, hit from all sides, so, I mean, I, I, I couldn't do your job. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm going to put a, a link for the uh, 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 literacy campaign also under there for people that might need that, although they might not be able to read that either. I'll talk to you later. Okay. And but, then also, also we got a caller that's been waiting uh, very patiently, and that would be caller uh, 928, is it? What, what, what's your yeah. name and where are you calling from? What's your question? My name is Keith, and I'm calling from Arizona. I'm very fascinated by um, your guest. Uh, was it Terrell? Is that your name, sir? Yeah, Terrell. That's my name, T-E-R-A-L. Terrell. Um, my question is about the shape of our local space. Um, my understanding is that we're pretty far out on one of the arms, and is it? do we have four arms of the galaxy? I, I wasn't sure if there was two or four arms of our galaxy. Yeah, but my t- understanding Two primaries were out three quarters way. Yeah, about three quarters of the way out. And mm-hmm. are those arms spinning? Is my question. Yes. And yes. Uh, the rotating disc is the model of the universe. That's just like our right. solar system. Our solar system is a microcosm of the galaxy itself. So my question is, how fast are we actually going? Because we've got our angular velocity around the uh, planet at. Uh, 24,000 uh, miles at uh, about a thousand miles an hour is what we're spinning just on the surface of the Earth. If you're at the equator, you know, of course, if you're at a different latitude, it's going to be a different speed. Then that spins around the sun, and then the sun rotates on that spiral arm, and then spins around the galaxy, and then spins around our local cluster, and then in our greater cluster. Uh, does anybody know? Have any idea how fast we're actually going? I don't know. We I think we might have been knocked off the air. So, um, who who can hear me right now? I can hear I can. you. Okay. Well, it looks like Terrell is the one that might be uh, knocked. I can off. hear. This is uh, six three zero. Uh, I I can hear you. Yeah, who else Ter- can hear uh, Hank Decker? Okay. Yeah. It seems to be with Terrell. Yeah, I think we lost Terrell. Right. That's what it looks like to me. Well, could I interject here? Yeah, no, go ahead, Sheldon. Well, you know, I think Terrell's object really is getting close, um, incredibly close, because back in 97 or 98 on the Art Bell Show, Father Malachi Martin said that the Vatican was watching an object coming this way, and it was, you know, already one or two years um, past the timeline that he gave us. And then we had John Moore's uh, information that 40 months ago, the continuity of government, uh, their their, what, what they call the continuity of government contingency operations. They, they had until December 31st of 2009 to uh, seal up their underground shelter. So um, obviously this, this object is well overdue. So just wanted to add that. Uh, you know, then you got the remote viewers that say that by June 1st uh, there's going to be a, a global coastal event. And then, of course, you got Cliff High and his web bot. And also, Andrew Basaggio of the Project Pegasus, he says that the U.S. Supreme Court building will be under 100 feet of brackish colored water sometime this year. Yeah, they're hey, all. Hey, I, go ahead. Hi, Tracker. How high did the remote viewers say the flooding was going to be? They gave you any, like, feeders or no? Well, there's there was one location. They, they, they had a number of locations. And if you looked at Kenya, Africa, the water had gone as far as 70 miles inland at that location. Mm. And it's interesting that they were they were going to remote view the Ken- the vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center also, but they never had enough time, I guess, to do that location. But I uncovered in my research that back in late 2007, NASA awarded a $73 million contract to a subsidiary a prudential subsidiary to start mo- relocating um, NASA's own people. And that was back in late 2007. And then we had um, Robert uh, Schock. He was the chief 
astronomer, I, I might have his name wrong, the, the chief astronomer at the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., um, you know, he, he, he gave an interview to uh, Sitchin, and, you know, he said what he saw, uh, what's coming in, he saw it, and then he died of fast-acting, I think, throat cancer. Yeah, that was actually Robert S. Harrington. He was a supervising astronomer of the U.S. Naval Observatory, and you know, right. there's, there's so must... much stuff. That's what I'm saying is that once you get, when you get so many complex problems in the world, and you know, why birds are dying, why the the, the things are getting beached, you know, just why, 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 and then you keep coming up with. In fact, that if if, if Terrell gets back on. Well, that's what I want to hit him with. I want to hit him with about the sinkhole. He never quite answered that one. And I'm going to guess that he's going to basically say that the uh, magna, um, uh, uh, you know, underneath the surface of the earth is heating up, um, which is causing the earth to actually expand. But um, uh, we'll talk for a minute, Sheldon. Let me go run and see if I can't grab Terrell. Well, yeah, you're talking about the sinkholes there. I was... Um there's another lady talk show host on a different network. Her name is Valerie, and I was talking to her significant other the other day, and he brought it up. Freedom, that's Freedomizer, right? The Freedomizer, right? And he brought up an interesting point about the sinkholes. He says, well, maybe with all their underground uh, tunneling they're doing, maybe the, these these pockets are forming these sinkholes. Right, well, this is only going to be like a two-minute break, and then we'll be right back. Uh, hang on. Okay, welcome back, folks. Uh, this is Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. This is the 192nd edition of Changing Reality. We are listener-supported, so anything you can do to help the station out, uh, it's much appreciated. Terrell, why don't you go first and let people know you, where they can get your contact information, and then Sheldon, then you can go. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, you can help the research by going to terrell03.com, T-E-R-A-L-03.com, and become a newsletter subscriber. I send you Dropbox folder links, two of them, and that's where the information you get. Uh, I upload every Thursday a new uh, newsletter gathering information from a lot of good researchers, just like Sheldon, and um, c- compile it together for you and make a 15-minute video to keep you updated on what's going on each week. The answer to that question previously before I – sorry, my system crashed – was that it's, it's not a constant speed because sometimes we're orbiting with the sun and sometimes we're, op- we're orbiting in the opposite direction of the sun. So that's not going to be a constant speed. But according to my research, I really don't think that's important. I think it's something that you can research for yourself out there on the Internet. We're about 28,000 light years from the center of the sun – I mean the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Draw yourself a circle, multiply by pi – you know, and it's it's a 20 to 25,000 mile, uh, a million years for us to go around once. So you can do the distance, to calculate the time, you know, you get the rate, and then you're going to know. And then you add and subtract 66,000 miles per hour, whether we're going with the sun or against it, and then you're going to have you're going to have your answer. Go ahead, open mic. Yeah, and Sheldon, why don't you give out where you can get um, your contact you with your um, website? Yeah, sure. Um, folks can go to my website, also the, the Light of Day Radio Show dot com, and I have a Planet X uh, logo depicted on the top there. And um, if you click on that, that'll take you to a sub page which has many Planet X um, uh, radio show interviews done by John DiNardo. I have a lot of John Moore stuff, Gilbert Erickson, uh, Lucas. And I also created these Planet X audio dramas where I embedded. Uh, some beautiful music in the background. It has various researchers, talk show hosts, and that attesting to the reality of this brown dwarf star. And th- those are really good to listen to. Those are on the the very bottom of the Planet X subpage. And boy, Terrell, it sure is. Uh, you sure got that computer back up quick. Uh, if you had a blue screen of death. Yeah, I just did the the fast as I could. It wanted to check the disc, and I said, "No, we'll do that later." Yeah, and, and before. Before I ask you about the sinkholes, I did want to get uh, the people kind of riding along, uh, listening by phone. Real smart Philly guy. I forgot your name again. It's it's Chris Hijacker or Poop. Chris. I'll go with Chris, yeah. Um, did you want to chime in? Do you have any question or anything? Well, this, you know, I, I, I listen to everybody, you know, 
you know, Tyrell was doing his job, Donnie Gilson was doing his job, John Moore. But I, I heard I heard a rumor that this might even turn us into a mini ice age when this passes, Tyrell. You been worrying about that or no? Well, the mini ice age is already starting. That's what happens whenever the ocean conveyor is disrupted. The warm water doesn't go north anymore. We're already seeing that right now. When things get too warm, the ice sheets melt. That's the engine for the ocean conveyor. Just imagine with no ice sheets at all. Then what's going to power the – What's where's the engine? And that's – you see, you don't have one. And then the warm water, it gets really warm at the equator, but it gets really, really cold at the poles until the ice sheets rebuild themselves, begin melting, and then – the engine kicks off again. So the, the engine is going to kick off again, but only after some really cold winters. Several, you should expect that the, uh, the number of months of winter is going to continue to be longer and longer until the ice sheets build up enough so that the ocean conveyor kicks off and goes, increases in velocity. Then as it cre- increases in velocity, you get the warm water going north and then you get the milder winters again. So we, the earth isn't stabilized yet. And yeah, it's very possible. And with the, uh, I had a question about um, one of my That's subscribers was, right there. was envisioning a 20 to 20, uh, 30 degree geological pole shift. And, and I'm like, why? In order to, for someone to tell you there's going to be a 20 to, to 30 degree pole shift, they have to have, I remember John Moore was mentioning that, they would have to know a lot of, they would have to have a lot of data They'd have to fill into the equations that they would need to know um, the mass ratio of the black star to the sun. They would have to know proximity. They would have uh, to the Earth th- throughout the entire cycle. Then they would have to know the magnetic polarity strength ratios, right? So when this thing comes between the Earth and the Sun, when does it grab magnetic polarity control? They need to know when this thing comes into orbit um, and then starts affecting the Earth. So in other words, if this thing comes from directly behind us, say let's say it's in the Libra constellation. The Earth is in the Libra constellation, and this thing comes by us. See, it's making kind of a straight line to the Sun. Well, Whenever it comes between us and the sun and we're going in the same direction, prograde, counterclockwise around the sun, this thing stays between us and the sun for a very long time, depending on its velocity. So you have to know velocities, right? And then the time duration, the mass ratio, the magnetic polarity strength, that's going to determine how, how the proximity determines and the, the magnetic polarity strength, how fast the earth tips over. Okay. It could go to 90 degrees if it's an alignment event. It could be a, if it's a, if it's a crossing event, like May 17th would be a crossing event, the Earth could be flipped 180 degrees and then could be flipped again depending on if this thing passes just in front of us, just behind us, if it's below us. You see what I mean? So I know enough to know that you need a lot of data to be, predict an angle of shift. Well, Terrell. And so the deal is you prepare for the worst case scenario and you don't worry about the angle of shift. Yeah, go ahead, Sheldon. I think that's why the the, the, the filmmakers of these movies are injecting so many uh, variabilities as to different scenarios as to what can happen because they don't even know um, themselves how bad things are going to get. Well, let me give you another scenario. Suppose that we're around, we're on the other side of Sagittarius, and this thing's coming in between Virgo and Libra. Then we have a uh, it, it comes across our path 90 degrees. So it's going to come between us and the sun, just like with the previous, except for instead of coming from behind us, it's going to come crossways. Then it's going to cross, it's going to cross Earth orbit path, but it's going to be briefly, and it's not going to come as close to us as if it's passing right under us. See, we're on around in orbit towards outside orbit position. It comes in between us and the sun. It's reaching perihelion, so it's going kind of fast. Where if it if it if it meets us in a straight line, then it's still. 93 million miles from reaching perihelion. And this, at, with the 90 degree angle, then it's only 40 th- a million miles from reaching perihelion, which means the velocity is very much faster. It's crossing our orbit path at a 90 degree. It's, cro- it's making uh, the alignment. When it comes into alignment with us and the sun, it's going very fast and it passes by very quickly. That could possibly provide a 20 degree to 30 brief pole shift. And then it gets out, and then the sun regains magnetic polarity control. And another thing that people don't realize is that after this, this dark star grabs magnetic polarity control and tips us over, the sun is going to regain magnetic polarity control and tip us back up. Now the sun regaining magnetic polarity control, that could happen very, very quickly. So the original pole shift could take, you know, a couple of days to happen to get us to 90 degrees, but the sun could tip us back up in six hours. So the, the actual 
big event would be the sun regaining magnetic polarity control and not this other object, then again, there's, there's only uh, two uh, opportunities for a crossing event. That's going to be on when, whenever we cross its orbit. Well, I'm sorry, whenever it crosses our orbit path on the way in and when it crosses our orbit path on the way out. And if my calculations are right, this is May the 17th on the inbound that we're approaching right now, and it's going to be in the first week in November on the backside. So any time during that period, we can come into alignment with it, and it, re and it grab magnetic polarity control. The closer to, ma to May the 17th, that means that it's closer to the Earth. The closer to November the 17th means it's closer to the Earth. Dead in the middle, that is going to be in the first week in October, then... Um, that's, a, that's an alignment event where the Earth is at the maximum distance away from the object. So you can gather that data by just building the models. Then that would be the slowest uh, pole shift um, and with the least amount of effect. But the, the worst ones are the crossing event on the uh, inbound on the outbound part of the orbit. Go ahead. Yeah, um, okay. We've got a couple callers stacked up, but uh, Mike and 406 – Hang on, I'll get your questions. I'm going to jump to a fellow host, the Mad Painter, who hosts uh, Open Canvas on Monday night at 10 p.m. Uh, Mad, so what say you? What, what, what do you want to say? Well, uh, first I want to say you're doing an excellent job there, Hijacker. i got to commend you there. And, uh, Terrell, you, you know I have a lot of respect for you and uh, your research. You're a heck of a researcher. I've uh, actually gone back and checked out all your 9-11 stuff. I've spoke with Jim Mars about you, and uh, I have a lot of respect for you. I just don't personally agree with the, the uh, Nibiru theory or the heavy mass object theory myself. I believe it boils down to a more simple thing, and it has to do with our sun. And uh, okay. we have gone... Personally, when I was a little kid, I'm an old guy, man. I'm I'm an old fart, an old hippie. And when I was when I was a kid, the sun was yellow. The sun is now white. I believe the sun has gone through a change, and it has affected our whole solar system. A heavy mass object would literally rip some of our smaller planets out of their orbits, and it hasn't done this. Okay. Um, the first thing that I would point out is that the magnetosphere turned around for 28 hours on March the 12th and 13th. Yeah, I, I remember well, when that happened. Okay. Well, it's impossible for the sun to create that phenomenon. It's impossible because the sun is a source. Well, what we understand about it, it's impossible. We don't know if, if something to do with our magnetic was interfering with that too now. I mean, we it's got no impossible. idea what's going on inside our Earth. We don't even know if our Earth is hollow or solid. We have no physical ev evidence that proves that the Earth isn't hollow or that it is solid. That's why we are postulating and we're gathering evidence to prove to, you know, so that we can draw a reasonable conclusion. But it's impossible for the Earth to turn its own magnetosphere around. It's impossible for the sun to do that because it has the solar wind has directionality from the sun. So for the the tail, the magneto pause, the tail of the, of the magnetosphere to point at the sun. Now, if that was a short duration event, two seconds, it could be a gamma ray burst. If it was, but because we're looking at an, an event that lasted about a full day, then we're looking at a source of subatomic particles coming from another constellation. If the tail would have pointed up at a 60 degree angle, then we could attribute that to a galactic influence because the, the ecliptic plane and the galactic plane are offset by 60 degrees. But the tail pointed at the sun, telling us that the source of subatomic particles, the electromagnetic flow of whatever it was, it was coming out of the Virgo constellation, right where my object is supposedly, and it has a planetary relationship with our sun. So it's like Jupiter and, and the Earth, it's on the same plane. So that's, what we, that's the information we can ex extrapolate from that singular event. But then... Um, You've got the sun going into a low period. Solar cycle 24 is a dud at the same time. And the, the low in the cycle between 23 and 24 was 2005. Now, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, the six to eight magnitude earthquakes went parabolic up. When you look at the solar cycle going back all the way back to, in, into the 1800s, then you see that the six to eight magnitude quakes appear at the solar maximums. So you're seeing a disconnect between the sun and the earthquakes. That rules out the sun as the source. 
It has well, to be could, couldn't that actually explain the Earth expanding slightly? Well, if you have a secondary magnetic portal connection, the Earth is receiving a secondary source of electromagnetism. Through the induction process, the largest magnetite deposit is under the North Pole. That would explain, because of the induction, it's, the, it's like an induction cooker. The metals inside the Earth are receiving that heat, heat energy. It's causing the northern ice sheets to melt and not the south, and the hotter core uh, creates the environmental conditions for the Earth to expand. That would create greater uh, space in between the tectonic plates and cause an earth increase in earthquakes. The caterpillar crawl effect around the world would, would increase, but also the, ma the magma domes around the planet if the hot core is hotter than Yellowstone, the calderas around the planet, they're going to, that's where the crust is thin. They're going to bulge up, and then the, the lava tubes servicing those, when the pressure gets too high, the, the pressure relief mechanisms are lava tubes. And they, they service the offshore volcanoes. And whenever those plugs start breaking in those lines, then you get more 2.5 to 4 magnitude quakes, and those also have been off the chart. And because, of, you know, these are symptoms of what I'm talking about, along with the sinkholes, dead birds from the magnetic pole migration. It's the magnetism that we're talking about here, and electromagnetism. And the sun is giving the Earth less magnetism today than it did during solar cycle 23, a lot less. That means you have to have another source of magnetism, and that's going to be another star, because you're not going to get magnetism from a planet or a comet or an asteroid, or it's not going to mag magically appear inside the Earth. So the solar cycle 24 being a dud, that tells me that something is siphoning energy off the sun. That would be a binary twin with a secondary magnetic portal connection. Its primary connection is connected to our sun. But when it's far away, the internal conduits are passive. When it comes close, they're active. That would explain why solar cycle 24 is a dud. Well, now, I, I, I believe we are a binary system, and I believe there is something out there that, it, that the ancients called Nibiru or Wormwood or whatever. But I also believe it's way off in the future yet for us. I, I, I just don't see where these are. I, I see a bunch of symptoms that you're lumping together into one hypothesis, but I believe that there's several theories that cover the whole bunch, if you know what I mean. It's, it can't yeah. be covered under one unified theory, you know? Yeah, that's what a lot of people think. The problem is we have a pattern of seismicity going back to 1965. And we have Earth axis shifts, the last three, one inch in Sumatra, 2004, and then the uh, Chile quake in uh, February 27, 2010, Fukushima on, on uh, March 11, 2011, one inch, three inch, and four inch, respectively, increasing. Okay, so you have a pattern of seismicity saying that something's getting closer, but the pattern has ended. If this thing was far away, we should have a regular cycle, like with Saturn. We, we, when you add 13 days to every year, you're going to pass but the sun, the Earth passes between the sun and Saturn. Add 13 days every year. Okay? Jupiter has a cycle. They all have a cycle. And this thing had a cycle too. But whenever an object is reaching perihelion with an elliptical orbit, then the cycle extends when it's coming close to the sun. And that's what we're seeing and right it now. It speeds up too. That's, that, yeah, that's why the, the, it appears to be farther left in the orbit diagram. There's a longer distance between the events then, and that's why I'm sitting here waiting for my alignment event, hoping it's not the same date that we cross its orbit path. Because if it is, we've got a crossing event, and the, the people that are predicting that New York City, I mean, sorry, Washington, D.C. is going to be under uh, 100 feet of water. Is that what the remote viewers are saw? That's what Cliffs High's people. The U.S. Supreme well, Court uh, holding I, I, I yeah. believe we're in Earth changes now. I, I mean, I mean, there's no doubt the Earth is changing, but uh, what's causing it? That's the debate. yeah. Let's let, you, <laughs> let's let Sheldon. What do you think? Let's I'll let let's, I'll let y'all oh. answer or finish talking. Yeah, I'd like let to let y'all go. Thank you for the show. It's been it's going great, man. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for dropping in. Well, I was going to add. I think the event is really close because this happens like every 3,600 years, and 3,600 years ago we had um, the the last event in 3,600 years before that was Noah's flood. And, you know, anybody that doubts, if anybody out there doubts Planet X ain't real, um, astronomers were looking for this thing over almost 200 years ago, and they actually named Pluto what it 
became because they were looking for Planet X. Uh, yeah, and I, I do want to get, we had a, a new caller, um, 406, before we close out the show. I want to make sure you get in here and, and talk, and then I'll get to you, Mike. Uh, so 406, go ahead. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Oh, this is Dean from Montana. Dean from Montana? How you doing? Okay. Um, I don't disbelieve Planet X or the Dark Star, and I don't believe it either. Um, but I would just ask Terrell, have you developed a body of mathematical work um, to prove what you're saying? Because I've heard you, Terrell, probably uh, about 15 or 20 times. And you use non sequiturs and uh, generalities to so-called prove your point. But I have never, ever heard you use any mathematical uh, points to prove your angle at all. So I, I would love to see you, Terrell, um, put on your website or wherever on your, on your, uh, on your page something to show me uh, the mathematical models of what you're saying. Simpos- and that's all I have to say. And, and I haven't seen them. I haven't heard them. And, and I think you're uh, full of a bunch of crap. Okay. Well, I got to say, bro. That's good. I, yeah, I love the skeptics. Um, a spectrum of people show up here. People that love me, people that hate me, people that, you know, the skeptics. And But you know what? You're here. So that's good. And Sub, I think he's in the chat room right now. He he was a hater at one time. The um the pro well, I started this investigation in January of 2011, and gather enough data to make the prediction of March the 15th that we were going to have the event, and it happened on March the 11th with Fukushima. So I'm the guy that's criticized for making dates. My fellow researchers tell me to stop making dates. Please stop doing that. And I'm the one telling you May 17th right now. I'm very precise. I told you April the 2nd. That was the next day on the 188-day cycle. Last year was September 26th. September 26th was a magical day. And who who came out later? John Moore and those guys talking about 926. So I think I'm pretty darn precise. The problem is when you're going to use a sandbox model, then you have to have input data. And, you know, if you know the mass is four Jupiter masses or whatever – then you can start building models, but you don't. We don't know. This thing could be a range of things. I call it a black star because it's mentioned in the Dakota report by lettered agency operatives writing about 9-11 and genocide is connected to Project Black Star. It's a black star, but that could be a magnetar-type neutron star. A, a, a thimbleful of that stuff weighs 100 tons. A neutron star that's twice the mass of the sun is only 10 kilometers across. So – a, a, a black dwarf star that is is uh, 50% larger than Earth is half sun mass. So we're, there, there's a uh, – this thing is unclassified. So if no, it's unclassified, are... then there's no way you can build a model for it. If it's more like a black hole that's theoretical than a star, then you're, it's, it's an effort of foolishness. You just can't do it. All you can do is monitor the Earth signs. It's the birth pain thingy from Scripture. I see the birth pangs. And I, I see the the, uh, the pattern, and I try to wake you guys up about there's something coming. That's that's really the most I can do. Go ahead, Sheldon. Yeah. Unfortunately, me and Terrell, we don't have access to those highly classified telescopes like down at the South Pole or the one over in Chile where that Japanese mur- uh, astronomer was murdered. And uh, so we don't have the ephemeris uh, data needed to uh, give you those kind of answers. Yeah, no, all we got is about a 1,000 different things that are happened from a thousand different data points and when you take the theory of the black star or a brown dwarf or this heavy mass object coming into our solar system that could be the reason why they're, they're going crazy building underground bases their planets are getting brighter earthquakes moons are starting to rain sun going white I mean, you just start plugging everything in, and as soon as you stick that master key in, you can understand it. Just well, like you know, just the just, just the behavior of the governments around the world is really bizarre, and for them to be 
been tunneling into the earth over the last few decades must mean that there's an event coming that's beyond their control, and that's why they have to hide like rats into the earth. Oh, yeah, I know. It's going crazy, but you can even understand when you say, well, what about um, uh, Sandy Hook? How does Sandy Hook plug into uh, Planet X or this black, uh, black Dwarf Star? Well, you know, what in the world? I mean, 20, 25 and 6-year-old children were shot six times by an assault rifle, and then the government wants to take our guns away? Why would they want to take our guns away? Why would they make this stuff up? They just, no body bags, no, no funerals, one big, no, no video evidence, just all of a sudden, oh, now we got to take your guns away because 20 children were shot. Well, that didn't work, so what's the next thing to do? Well, why has the government been buying up all the bullets, buying, you know, getting tanks and armored person, uh, personnel vehicles, uh, 2.5 billion bullets, you can't even get the stuff now? I mean, why? Well, it's a, a black dwarf star is coming through. The whole planet's about to be upset. And yes. they know we got our guns, and they're taking our ammo away. I mean, you can plug anything in. But, but we only got like three minutes left. I did want to get the mic because he's been waiting patiently the whole time. Uh, so 30 seconds, Mike, and then we'll jump, and then we'll, we'll close out things. Go ahead. Yeah, there was a rare uh, snowstorm last night. I went through, uh, they, they named these things now. It was called Achilles. Uh, not that it's relevant. We do have... Uh, Lots of flooding going on uh, this year and, and now in the Midwest, uh, uh, subsequent to the uh, uh, drought that we had for three years. But like, like uh, Hijacker was saying, uh, we're, we're not only physical beings, we're spiritual beings. Take a lesson from the fig tree. Uh, when you hear of wars, rumors of wars, look at China with the pestilence, the, the bird flu. Um, this is a spiritual war, too. Look at Wall Street. That's the great Babylon. What falls? Think of the mark of the beast. All of these things are, are coming in, into vision. That's, that's what you should be paying attention to. Not, not just the destroyer. That's going to, going to be God's tool. He's used it in the past. And the sun will be darkened, and the moon will no longer shut its light. Look, look to the spiritual side, too. And that's all i got to say. Okay, and if somebody knows who is scheduled to take roundtables after my show, uh, let me know. If not, then I'm going to just hold the server and ride. And so we only got a couple minutes left. Uh, Sheldon, one more time, your website, and then Terrell, how that we can get your information. 30 <coughs> seconds. Uh, folks can go to my website, thelightofdayradioshow.com, and click on the Planet X uh, logo at the top. Okay, very good. And then, Terrell, where can they get uh, support your ministry and get your information? Terrell03.com. Become a newsletter subscriber, and then I begin, we begin having email exchanges, and I include your information in the uh, newsletter and in the videos, and that's how we together can help people wake up and see the pattern. Okay, and for everybody out there, I'm going to go ahead and hold the server and take round tables, at least for the first part. Because I got this gamed out and I spent two days, the first two days on my show, and I never got to what I see they're getting ready to do. And there are reports of special op Navy SEAL people being assassinated. There's, 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 they say there's atomic weapons buried all over this country, that there's going to be something like seven nuclear explosions that start on May 5th, and that's going to spin out of control. And... Um, I just wanted to throw my two cents in. 484, um, uh, Chris, do you have anything yeah, you want to say? before? You know, if, you, if you've ever seen Jericho, it's about the United States using nuclear bombs on themselves. It's, it's on Netflix. Oh, yeah, it's I've seen series. it. Yeah. It's, it's mind-blowing because it's all coming to hand. And when the caller called in about China, now China's been throwing all kinds of weird stuff in the, the river over there. This week, they just found body parts floating around, and their their virus is jumping from people to people over there. Whatever they're oh, yeah, right. Well, listen, we're going. On, I'm going into overdrive, overtime. So anybody that can stay, they're all feel free to stay. I know it's late, Sheldon. Anybody that wants to stay, well, I'm just going to hold the lines.